the rise of a white Christian nationalist movement in the U.S. A party of Christian nationalists? The Republican Party, it is a Christian nationalist movement, a white Christian nationalist movement. It's dangerous because it's a radically anti-democratic ideology. And it has been around for a long time. It is a pervasive and deeply embedded ideology. That very white Christian nationalist idea, ask it that specifically, we have a majority of white evangelicals saying yes. Some challenges in the Republican Party with far right extremists, uh, white nationalists, uh, Christian nationalists. A strong man form of government is actually OK and is desirable if it delivers, as Matt said, the Christian white nationalist agenda. Stamp the entire Republican Party as fans of this white Christian nationalism, because that's where they are. Pin them down. When they envision one nation under God, it is a white Christian nation. They have become the sort of def the white defense party or the white Christian nationalist party. Is that a fair statement? Yes. You know, I'm, t I'm trying to figure out what they were saying there. I, I missed the point. Good heaven. Hello, America. I want to show you, tonight's show, uh, I want to uh, show you a couple of things. Uh, we're going to do a show on, and it's tonight, so lucky us, uh, on white Christian nationalists. This is from uh, CNN, <laughs> the most trusted name in, I don't know what. Uh, and this one, is, this one just came out. This is from The Atlantic. I like this one. How extremist gun culture is trying to co-op the rosary. This is a hysterical, hysterical uh, uh, story. Both of them are funny if it wasn't that, as you just saw there, the talking points are now to aimed to destroy Christianity as you know it. Remember, this is the idea of the progressives, to destroy everything. They have to destroy our language, our traditions, our churches, our homes, our families, our businesses, our very way of life, the way we understand our own sexuality. All of it has to be destroyed so they can build something new on top. And they are busy there in Washington trying to make sure that they can paint us into radicals. All right, so let's go into this today. And I, I'm, I, this is an important thing because if you're at all Christian or you care about Christians or Jews or anybody else, you really need to understand this because this is their point of attack. CNN posted that hatchet job article about crazy dangers of white Christian nationalist movement. All right. I'm sure there are white Christian nationalists somewhere. I don't know any. I don't know anybody in the party that knows anybody. Maybe they're there, but I don't think that's what we're wanting. This is a growing trend now on the left to vilify Christian nationalism, which is a bad thing. But the left seriously thinks that the goal of every white American Christian born in here in America wants to create Gilead, you know, the theocratic dictatorship from The Handmaiden's Tale. At least that's what they want you to believe we believe. I mean, this is crazy. This CNN article is so misleading and ignorant that it's almost a waste of your time. But the, um, the actual facts and the setting the record straight is not a waste of your time. It's extraordinarily important. The left in general, and okay, except for CNN, they're truly, uh, they're truly trying to group all Americans um, as white Christian nationalist. And because of that, it is important to show you this CNN piece and others and break it down and give you some rebuttals that you can share with your friends to refute this amateur smear campaign, because this will be here for a while. First, I want to read a couple of quotes from the uh, article about the idea of separation in church and state. They say, Erasing the line separating piety from politics is a key characteristic of white Christian nationalism. Many want to reduce or erase the separation of church and state, say those who study the movement. Later, in talking about the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade, CNN goes on to say, white Christian nationalists are inspired by those decisions because one of their central goals is to erase the separation of church and state in the U.S. 
The left has successfully elevated the separation of church and state to an absurd level that the founders, including Thomas Jefferson, wouldn't even recognize. They would really hit us across the head and say, what are you, stupid? For example, earlier this year, a Michigan high school student was suspended for three days by his school for stating his Christian belief on his own social media accounts as well as discussing his faith in the school hallway without a teacher present to monitor and guide the conversation. Oh my gosh. I'm surprised we haven't executed this kid. There are hundreds of examples like this. You hear about these examples of you know, cases like this every now and again. Um, but let me do the job that CNN has failed to do and define and tell you the history of separation of church and state, what it actually means. And I'll do that by consulting this guy, Thomas Jefferson, the guy who progressives credit with inventing the phrase they love so much. How could you possibly listen to Thomas Jefferson? Thomas Jefferson said all men are created equal. He didn't know about slaves. Separation of church and state. Thomas Jefferson said it all bow to Thomas Jefferson. When Jefferson became president in 1801, his election was particularly well accepted by the Baptists. The Baptists appreciated that Jefferson had a record of standing up for religious freedom for Baptists, but also Methodists and Presbyterians and Jews. Okay, plus he was trying to bring the end to the official state Anglican church in Virginia. Because of this well-known record, Jefferson received many letters of congratulations from the Baptist organizations following the election. Well, one of those letters was dated October 7th, 1801. It's this one, from the Baptist Association of Danbury, Connecticut. The letter begins with an expression of great satisfaction that Jefferson won the election and then express their grave concern over laws protecting their freedom of exercise of religion. And they were troubled by the idea that religious privileges were being guaranteed by the apparent generosity of the government. Wait, why would ministers object to the state guarantee the guarantee of religious freedom? Because to the insightful Danbury Baptists, the presence of governmental language protecting their free exercise of religion suggested that it was a government-granted right. And if that was the case, and it wasn't a God-given inalienable right, well, they thought maybe someday the government might just think that this could be regulated or taken away. They believed that government should not interfere with any public religious expression unless, as they told Jefferson, that religious practice caused someone to, quote, work ill to his neighbor. The Danbury Baptists wrote to President Jefferson fully understanding that he was an ally of their viewpoint. It was Jefferson's firm position that the federal government had no authority to interfere with, limit, regulate or prohibit public religious expressions, a position that he stated all the time. Jefferson replied to the Danbury Baptists, assuring them, you don't have anything to fear. The government would not meddle with their public or private religious expressions. Quote, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that the act of whole American people, which declared in the First Amendment, that their legislators should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building... <gasps> he sat at a wall of separation between church and state. Yeah. Let's bring in the Legos for some of those Americans that are a little slow. I'll go slow. Look at the pretty church. And it's got probably some evil preacher in there. And here, of course, is the government. And the government is so friendly. And look, pay no attention to the guy with the lasso. He, he's uh, only going to do that to horses. Definitely not people. He's definitely not the FBI. No, no. So here it is. Here is the government. Here is the church. Here's the wall that they love to say was placed there. Okay? The wall of separation between church and state. 
It was a metaphor used by Jefferson not to secularize the public square, but rather the opposite. You see, here's what happened. Back then, we all understood the church was part of this community, kind of like a fancier Chuck E. Cheese without the good food. Uh, that was part of it. And they knew the government had a little guy with a lasso right here. And they're like, you know what? He's going to start doing stuff. And so I think we should put a wall separating the guy with the lasso so he can't lasso anybody here. And they're protected over here from them. This would protect their religious rights and their religious rights and their non-religious rights, no matter what it was, everybody over here was protected from the government. Early American courts identified a very small class of actions that have done in the name of religion, the government did have a religious uh, uh, or a legitimate reason to limit that religious practice. It included bigamy, concubinish, uh, concubinage, which I think we've pretty much wiped out at this point. Incest, child sacrifice, infanticide, parricide, and other harmful crimes. But outside of the destructive behaviors like that, the government wasn't allowed to impede in traditional religious expressions in public. The wall. See, they, they look at it like this, that they're on side of the town hall. No, that's our state government that does that. Okay? The, we're, 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 we're protecting these guys from the evil. No, it's this way. The separation of church and state was understood to mean preserving and protecting religious expression in public and private. So how did the understanding change? Well, through landmark Supreme Court rulings in 1947 and 48. Oh my gosh, right there in the progressive era. Everson versus Board of Education and McCollum versus Board of Education. These rulings, the Supreme Court completely reversed the historic meaning of separation in church and state. The court didn't cite Jefferson's full letter. Why should they? I mean, it's just all, all I want are the eight words. Completely cutting out all of the historic context. As a result, for the first time, Jefferson's phrase was used to limit rather than to protect religion in the public square. Thomas Jefferson approved religious activities as president. You're going to love this one. Write it down. Remember this. It would get him canceled by the left today. He approved a plan for a Christian church service to be held each Sunday in the Capitol's largest room, the Hall of the House of Representatives. Jefferson attended those services himself throughout his two terms as president. Under President Jefferson, you know, separation, church, and state, church Sunday services were also started at the War Department and the Treasury Department, all government buildings of the executive branch under his direct control. So on any given Sunday, worshipers could choose between attending a church at the U.S. Capitol or the War Department or the Treasury Department, all with the blessing of Jefferson. He also wrote the plan for uh, education in Washington, D.C., you know, for the public schools, which included the idea that the Bible would be the primary reading text for students. And he di uh, directed the Secretary of War to give federal funds to a religious school established for Cherokee, Cherokees in Tennessee. Now, these don't really sound like the actions of a guy who was terrified of the church. He said he was afraid the government would show up in the public square and in the churches. Not one, not even his critics, his enemies ever objected to Jefferson's governmental religious practice or claimed that they were improper and violated the Constitution. They didn't then, and it shouldn't be that way today. It's only because of faith phobes on the left that demand it. Basically, if I may quote the Princess Bride, separation of church and state, I do not think it means what you think it means. Now, I want you to know that this is what they're building. But if we take this away, okay, they do have another idea. 
and they're working quite hard on that, and that is fixed. Another CNN dubious claim about America's Christian heritage. Next. Do you remember when the Joker said, this town deserves a better class of criminals, and I'm going to give it to them? Little known fact, that was the, when home title theft was invented, and now it's everywhere, not just in Gotham. Yeah, that damn Joker. Here's how you find out if you've become a victim of home title theft. Go to HomeTitleLock.com, then just enter your address for free, no obligation home title scan. This is how you're going to discover if somebody's already camping on your home's title. Look, your title to your home is the only document that proves you actually own it. And once somebody forges the title, they can take out loans on your home or forge their name on documents stating that they're the new owner. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, not so much. First things first, let's make sure your home is securely um, uh, uh, safe, <laughs> securely locked home title. Well, it's win the digital safe with home title because it's all online. You can go do whatever it is that they do at hometitlelock.com and use the radio code radio, even though we're on TV. Crazy, right? Enter your address for free, no obligation, home title scan, $100 value free, hometitlelock.com, code radio. Sorry, government's still not finished destroying everything. Anyway, CNN thinks that white Christian nationalism is one of the biggest threats to the American democracy, or republic. Let me give you a couple of quotes here from the recent feature about this threat. One of the most popular beliefs among white Christian nationalists is that the U.S. was founded as a Christian nation. But the notion that the U.S. was founded as a Christian nation is just bad history and bad theology. No, actually it's not. It's not just a popular belief among white Christian nationalists that the U.S. was founded on a, as a Christian nation. No. Not bad history either. In fact, I've got, a, I've got a whole museum. You should come and see. I could take days just on this. American leaders have widely stated this belief throughout U.S. history, but the left doesn't really give an honest look. They hear Christian nation and they automatically go, they want a theocracy. No, we've never been a theocracy, um, and neither have the Christians in America. Never. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Why did people come here? The earliest Christian settlers came here because they were fleeing persecution from theocratic governments. On the nosy. The last thing they wanted to set up was another theocracy here. America is a Christian nation because its values, cultures, and institutions were shaped by the principles of the Bible. Now, this is a little like saying Iran. Iran what does the Koran have to do with Iran? Uh, even without the theocracy, it was set up on those principles, you know, kind of like Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Okay. But what's different is what happened here in America. All faiths, all beliefs. You didn't even have to believe. You, no one was excluded. All were welcomed. But in general, the principles of Christianity informed our public policy. And this didn't used to be controversial, not until lately. Let me take you through some historic evidence showing that every generation until right now was considered uh, that we were a, a Christian nation. You're going to love this one. Let me start with some presidential quotes, some, some declarations here by some presidents I think you're going to like. America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the true elements of righteousness, which are derived from the revelations of Holy Scripture. Now, who said that? Come on. Come on, it's every leftist top five president, everybody's favorite, Woodrow Wilson. Okay, this guy hated religion, 
hated it, hated it, but he knew this. He couldn't get away from this. Otherwise, he would have been done. Okay, here's another one. I like this one. This is a Christian nation. In this great country of ours, there's demonstrated the fundamental unity of Christianity and democracy. Who said that one? <laughs> Harry Truman. Okay. Then there's this one. In the last 200 years, we have guided the building of our nation and our society by those principles and precepts brought to earth nearly 2,000 years ago on that first Christmas. Yeah. See, I, are you developing a pen? Because look at this. That was Lyndon B. Johnson. Huh. Oh, and I've got all kinds. I even have the prayer that he gave on air on D-Day. I, I have his Bibles that he sent out to the troops over at the museum. So, there, you know, you have FDR and a couple of other, you know, people. Uh, you've got uh, Dwight Eisenhower saying it. You've got Herbert Hoover saying it. Love that guy. How about John Adams? How about Thomas Jefferson? How about everybody's favorite? I mean, I can't get enough of John Tyler, right? Zachary Taylor, I'm gonna put him there with John because I'm sure they hung out. Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant, you know, the guy who fle freed the slaves. Uh, William McKinley, and even Nick Nixon. Yeah. Now, I could go on, but my staff begged me, please don't make us make any more magnets. All right, but it's just our presidents. They're being overly sentimental. They don't actually mean that stuff. Well, okay, let's go back to our charters, America's colonial charters and governments. Um, ooh, here's one. The Mayflower Compact of 1620 declared that their endeavor was, quote, undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. 1629, Massachusetts Bay Colony, their charter declared that winning the country to the knowledge and obedience of the only true God and Savior of mankind and the Christian faith is the principal end of this plantation. <gasps> plantation? They had, no, we meant colony, different kind. In 1954, uh, there was a speech by U.S. Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren. Let me summarize it here just with this quote. I believe no one can read the history of our country without realizing that the good book and the spirit of the Savior have been from the beginning, been our guiding geniuses. Whether we look to the first charter of Virginia, oh, I didn't show you that one, or the charter of England, yep, charter of uh, Massachusetts Bay, yeah, or the fundamental orders of Connecticut, I could show you that, the same objective is present, a Christian land governed by Christian principles. Okay, well, that's a judge. We can't trust judges anymore. We can trust Nancy Pelosi, you know, the legislative branch. In 1854, a House Judiciary Committee uh, said, and I quote, had the people during the revolution had a suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. At the time of the adoption of the Constitution and amendments, the universal sentiment was that Christianity should be encouraged, not any one sect or uh, denomination. In this age, there can be no substitute for Christianity. That, in its general principles, is the great conservative element on which we must rely for the purity and permanence of free institutions. The House also said in 1856, uh, they made a little declaration, the great, vital, and conservative element in our system is the belief of our people in the pure doctrines and divine truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, surely, our judi a judicial branch, when they actually just weren't spouting nonsense, when they had a rule, they had better sense to imply that America was a Christian nation. 
Actually, no. On hundreds of occasions over the past two centuries, state and federal courts routinely made the declaration. Uh, in fact, U.S. Supreme Court decisions declared America as a Christian nation in 1844, 1892, 1931. In fact, uh, David Brewer, he was a justice. He was the author of the unanimous 1892 Supreme Court decision. He explained, quote, Christianity came to this country with the first colonist and has been powerfully identified with its rapid development, colonial and national, and today exists as a mighty factor in the life of the republic. This is a Christian nation. The calling of this republic a Christian nation is not a mere pretense, but a recognition of the historic, legal, and social truth. Even Chief Justice Earl Warren you know, a guy who helped usher in all the activist stuff, you know, from the courts. Uh, he acknowledged the source of our laws. Ready? Quote, I believe the entire Bill of Rights came into being because of the knowledge our forefathers had of the Bible and their belief in it. Freedom of belief, freedom of expression, of assembly, petition, the dignity of the individual, the sanctity of home, the equal justice under the law, and the reservation of the powers to the people. I like to believe... We are living today in the spirit of the Christian religion. I also like to believe that as long as we do so, no great harm can come to our country. Hey, are we still living that? This is a short highlight reel. I mean, I could go on all night. The left, their flavor of the month is attacking now the traditional Christian faith. It's white Christian nationalism. Jeremiah Wright, 12 years ago, he was fine. What are you talking about? How dare you say that that was black nationalism? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so they're trying to spread the lie that America's heritage as a Christian nation is simply a fantasy of white Christian nationalists. It's not a fantasy. And that doesn't take a white Christian nationalist to know that. It takes anybody who can read. It's not wishful thinking. It's a well-established fact. And just as I showed you American leadership across the political spectrum used to openly acknowledge this fact throughout our history, then change it. Unfortunately, there are plenty of more lies that the CNA and uh, hit piece uh, put out, and they really need to hang on just a second. Sorry, that one churchgoer was moving. Uh, they all need to be addressed. And I think I'm going to take on their claim. The founding fathers, they didn't have faith. Oh, next. Okay. If you're one of the millions of Americans who suffer every day from pain, sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. Bad. I don't think I need to tell you any more than that. Have you tried everything? Are you sick of hearing the doctor say, well, uh, you know, are you exercising? Shut up. Shut up. Fatty fats. Anyway, here's what you can do. Try Relief Factor. Try Relief Factor. Try it for three weeks. See if it works for you. If it doesn't, you're going to be out 20 bucks. I'll give you that. But if it does, like it does with 70% of the people who try it, they go on to order more month after month, you get your life back. So get the three-week quick start right now. Try it for $19.95. $19.95 at relieffactor.com. That's relieffactor.com. Yeah. By the way, I'm, I'm going to make all of these documents available. Um, we have them all over at the museum. I could go on and on and on and on with this. It's pretty overwhelming when you actually see it. So now, one of the other favorite attacks on America's indisputable Christian heritage is that our founders, well, they weren't really Christians. They were deists, which is kind of like a watchmaker. He makes the watch and then he walks away. Well, I mean... Uh, a good thrashing of CNN would really not, uh, would not miss this quote. Virtually none of our founders could be classified as evangelical Christians. Well, well, I will tell you, they were nothing like you, you white Christian nationalist rubes. So what's their evidence? Well, they don't really, they talk to experts who weren't there, um, you know. But I had the idea 
We should go back and look at what the founders said in their own words. Because if I read that, then you'll know, oh, these guys were not Christian. I mean, it's not any kind of Christianity you might recognize. So I wanted to start with a little teeny minor figure, a real lightweight, uh, John Adams. Quote, The Holy Ghost carries on the whole Christian system in this earth. Uh, Not a baptism, not a marriage, not a sacrament can be administered by the Holy Ghost. There is no authority, or civil or religious. There can be no legitimate government, but what is administered by the Ghost, the Holy Ghost. There can be no salvation without it. All without it is rebellion and perdition, or in more orthodox words, damnation. He doesn't sound like a preacher that I've ever heard. Samuel Adams, you know, he signed the declaration, but he makes really good beer too. He said, I rely on the merits of Jesus Christ for a pardon of all my sins. I conceive we cannot better express ourselves than by humbly supplicating the supreme ruler of the world for the promoting and speedily bringing on the holy and happy period when the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ may be everywhere established and the people willingly bow to the scepter of him who is the Prince of Peace. I'm just hoping he comes with a scepter and he just, once in a while, just like, you know what I mean? Anyway, Josiah Bartlett, he was asked to sign the Declaration of Independence and he said, confess before God our aggravated transgressions and implore his pardon. Who? I don't know yet. Oh, here it is. And forgiveness through the merits and uh, mediation of Jesus Christ that the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ may be known to all nations. I'd like it to be known just to this one. Charles Carroll, signer of the Declaration of Independence, on the mercy of my Redeemer, I rely for salvation and on his merits, not on the works I have done in obedience to his precepts. I, Charles Carroll, hope that through and by the merits, sufferings, and mediation of my only Savior, Jesus Christ, I may be admitted into the kingdom prepared by God for those who love, fear, and truly serve Him. That's a watchmaker if I've ever heard one. You know what I mean? He said it and walked away. Alexander Hamilton, you know, the the black guy that was, uh, oh my gosh, he's white. How did that happen? Is this picture real? He said, I have a tender reliance on the mercy of the Almighty through the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, Alexander Hamilton also recommended the formation of what he titled the Christian Constitutional Society. There was no wall there. He had just one room. It listed two goals for it, supporting the Christian religion and the U.S. Constitution. What? This organization was to have numerous clubs throughout each state. They met regularly to work and elect to office those who reflected these goals. But did you notice I used the word clubs? They had clubs everywhere. Of course they do. It's just like those Christians, the club people. Here's another one. John Hancock. Have you ever heard of him? Signer of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, He actually... um, He called on the state of Massachusetts to pray this, that all nations may bow to the scepter of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the whole earth may be filled with his glory. That spiritual kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ may be continually increasing until the whole earth shall be filled with his glory to confess their sins before God and implore his forgiveness through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But wait, what about the separation of church and state? Apparently, these guys uh, thought government was a little more threatening than Christianity. The left has completely flipped this around. Next, on our hit parade of signers, Samuel Huntington, signer of the Declaration of Independence at number 42. It becomes a people publicly to supplicate the pardon that we may obtain forgiveness through the merits and mediation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Did, has anybody noticed that they're like, hey, we should humble ourselves and maybe ask for forgiveness? And they did all this without a spin doctor or a copy machine. Uh, then there was Robert Treat Payne, signer of the declaration. I desire to bless and praise the name of God Most High for appointing me, my birth, in a land of gospel light, where the glorious tidings of a Savior and pardon and salvation through him may have been continually sounding in mine ears. Oh, he's got more. I am constrained to express my adoration of the Supreme Being, the author of my existence, in full belief of his providential goodness and his forgiving mercy revealed to the world through Jesus Christ, through whom I hope for never-ending happiness in a future state. Give it a rest, man. I believe the Bible to be the written word of God and to contain in it the whole rule of faith and manners. There you go. Benjamin Rush, he was kind of important. He signed the Declaration of Independence. My only hope of salvation is in the infinite, transcendent love of God manifested by the world by his death of his son upon the cross. Which son was that? Was it Steve? Was it Bill? Was it Pete? No, it was Jesus. He even was like, I rely on it exclusively upon it. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I'm there now. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm like, bring it on, man. The great enemy of the salvation of man, he said, in my opinion, never invented a more effective means of limiting Christianity from the world than by persuading mankind that it was improper to read the Bible at schools. Do I hear a amen? The Bible should be read in our schools in preference to all other books. Really? Even that LGBTQ trans library? Really? Slow down. Here's Benjamin Rush reading the Bible in school. <laughs> what a white Christian nationalist. Finally, Roger Sherman, signer of the Declaration and Constitution. Quote, I believe there is only one living and true God existing in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What a whack job, right? He's not like a Christian like you know. In the same substance, equal in power and glory, that the scriptures of the New and Old Testaments are revelation from God and complete rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. I believe that God did send his own son, I think this time it was Pete, to become a man, die in the room. Die in the room. Probably was Pete. Uh, instead of sinners and thus lay a foundation for the offer of pardon and salvation to all mankind so they may be saved who are willing to accept the gospel offer. Oh my gosh, these guys went on and on. I believe the souls of believers, that they are, uh, that their death made perfectly holy and immediately taken to glory, that at the end of this world there will be a resurrection of the dead, final judgment of mankind, when the righteous shall be publicly acquitted by Christ, the judge, and admitted to everlasting life and glory, and the wicked, uh, the wicked be sentenced to everlasting punishment. Dare I say, hell. <laughs> yep, they don't sound Christian to me. You didn't recognize any of those as like pretty big doctrine, you know, for a Christian, because I didn't. I, didn't, I missed that. Now, those are just some of the highlights. There are many, many more examples. Oh, not a Tobin chef. Yes, there is. Yeah, but not a George White. Yes, there is. To say that virtually none of the founders could be classified as evangelical Christians, that's just dishonest. I mean, how do you define an evangelical? Somebody who goes on and on and on talking about Jesus? Uh, back in a minute with just one more ignorant claim from CNN. And this one's about the U.S. Constitution. America needs more companies like American Financing. Now more than ever, if you're smart, and I'm pretty sure you are, I <laughs> mean, you're here, you know what I'm saying? You're concerned about where your money is going, how much you're spending every month, how much you're savings, and what the future holds. American Financing understands. They want it to help you out. Give them a call today. Do it when you've got 10 minutes, and they're going to perform a free mortgage review. There are no tricks, no obligations. They're not going to try to convince you that, you know, to do anything that's not good for you. I say, kill the family cat. That will save you. What? They actually work for you, not the banks, who are all cat killers, I've heard. By getting a consolidation loan to deal with things like 
credit card debt, I mean, the percentages in, that you're paying, the interest rates, sky high, and it's only going to get higher. Maybe equity in your home could be used to pay off those debts. Equity is at a high right now. American Financing will work with you, and they'll find the thing that is right for you. I want you to call them at 800-906-2440, 800-906-2440, or go to AmericanFinancing.net. Do I have an amen? Yeah, a Lego doobie man. I want to focus on one more of CNN's misleading statements. And this one really kind of sounds out as embarrassing, really. I mean, it's an example of basic historic ignorance and Bible literacy, both together in one big bowl. Quote, the Constitution also says nothing about God, the Bible, or the Ten Commandments. Yeah, the Constitution doesn't cite specific Bible verses, but it didn't need to. Americans of that era knew the Bible well to understand all of the references. For example, the Constitution stipulates that the, when Congress passes a bill, the president has 10 days to sign the bill, Sundays accepted. Sundays. Sundays. The Christian Sabbath. They were excluded from the Constitution from the count of the allotted 10 days. Why is that? Just as the Sunday's accepted clause shows the religious context of the Constitution, so too do the five oath-taking clauses. The founders repeatedly affirmed that oath-taking was a solely religious activity. For example, James Madison called it the strongest of religious ties. John Adams said the oaths were sacred obligations. Declaration signer John Witherspoon said taking an oath indeed is an act of worship. Maybe that's why everybody lies on the stand today, because nobody takes it seriously. Whose fault is that? The Constitution declares in Article 7 that it was written in the year of our Lord, uh, 1787. Now, most legal documents of that day only give the year. Very few added in the year of our Lord, but the drafters of the Constitution personalized that phrase, making it in the year of our Lord. That's even more rare. Other parts of the Constitution also demonstrate a reliance on biblical principles and rhetoric. For example, the provisions that a president must be a natural born citizen and another regarding witnesses and capital punishment are right, right from the scriptures with instructions in chapter 17 in the book of Deuteronomy. Write that down. Don't he say Deuteronomy? What? Our three branches of government parallels Isaiah 33, 22, which says, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. It is he who will save us. That's nonsense. Ezra 7.24 even sets forth the type of tax exemptions that the founders gave to churches. Tax exemptions that still exist today. Well, wait a minute. What time is it? The protections of the due process clauses of the Constitution, the Fourth through the Eighth Amendments, were based on biblical teachings. Even recently retired Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, who was one of the most secular-minded justices in the Supreme Court history, openly acknowledges that, quote, the right to an accused to meet his accusers face-to-face -face is mentioned, among other things, in the Bible. In proof of this, Breyer cites Federal Practice and Procedure, a book which devotes more than 20 pages to documenting the ways the Bible directly shaped the due process clauses of the Bill of Rights. Numerous founders involved with the Constitution's writings and, ramif uh, and uh, ratifications testified they believed the Constitution was directly influenced by God himself. For example, James Madison testified that the Constitution was a result of the finger of the Almighty Hand. Now, we're getting a finger from the Almighty Hand in Washington, and it's not the right finger. Okay, he said it had to be manifest to bring us through this um, revolution. Significantly, several founders invoked the unique phrase, finger of God, which is used in the Bible to represent miraculous manifestations of his authority and power. Alexander Hamilton declared that the Constitution was a system with which out the without the finger of God never could have been suggested and agreed upon. Amen. George Washington avowed that the Constitution appears to me to be little than, uh, l than little short of a miracle. It will demonstrate as visibly 
the finger of providence as possible as any possible event in the course of human affairs can ever designate it. Benjamin Franklin believed that the writing of the Constitution had been, quote, influenced, guided, and governed by the omnipotent, omnipresent, and beneficent, benef yeah, that one, a nice ruler in whom all inferior spirits live and move and have their being. Christians will recognize the last part of that statement as Acts chapter 17. So basically, it's not really going out on a limb to say the founders definitely did not see the Constitution as secularly produced as a document. There is no question that many of the Constitution's clauses and provisions are both filled with and inspired by biblical and Christian principles. It's not a purely secular document, as the left tries to assert today. It was influenced uh, by the Bible. And according to John Adams, it will not work properly if ever it ever becomes purely secular. As he affirmed, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. I think he's talking about us. In an attempt to document the source of the unique ideas created the longest ongoing constitution in world history, political scientists from the University of Houston analyzed writings from the founding era covering the years 1760 to 1805. Their goal was to identify the specific political authorities quoted during that period. Selecting 15,000 representative writings and the researchers identified 3,154 direct quotations in the works. They documented the original sources of those quotations. The results showed a singular, single source cited far more, far more, above and away, the Bible. 34% of all of the quotes in, that is in the representative writings of the founding era were taken directly from the Bible. According to the researchers, quote, although the citations come virtually every part of the Bible, St. Paul was the favorite in the New Testament. St. Peter was the next. Then John's Gospel, Deuteronomy, was the most cited Old Testament book, followed by Isaiah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and other prominently cited books of the Bible were Psalms, Proverbs, Jeremiah, Chronicles, and Judges. Get this. Especially in light of CBS, CNN's dubious claims, Newsweek concluded, now historians are discovering that the Bible, perhaps even more than the Constitution, is our founding document. But don't tell anyone on the left. It might start another mostly peaceful riot. These things are important for you to know, and it's important for you to state the very obvious. I have really good friends from all religions. I love the way people practice peaceful uh, practices of, of religion to worship God. I, I know people who are atheists don't have, they're just the same as me. I mean, we have the same rights. I don't want a theocracy. I don't know anybody that does. Christian, white Christian nationalists, it's a hobgoblin. Hobgoblin. CNN should look that up. That's a good word. See you tomorrow on the radio. Good night, America. Thank <laughs> you.